evening all and you are welcome to the second section of this lecture which is on instruments and devices and we are going to follow the outline as we earlier mentioned these are the various instruments and materials used for patient management we are going to be discussing and we'll start with urethral catheter this is a self-retaining urethral catheter because it has a balloon that makes it retained so it is called a self-retaining urethral catheter and we are going to talk about the various parts the types indications for use Procedure for catheterization, its complications and contraindications. The various parts of the urethral catheter include the funnels, which meets at the Y junction. There is a drainage funnel for draining the urine and the inflation funnel that has a valve. The inflation funnel is for inflating the balloon. It has the catheter shaft and the catheter shaft carries channel from both the inflation funnel and also a channel from the eye to the drainage funnel. It also has the tip of the catheter and the eye from which the drainage commences and exits through the drainage funnel. So based on the number of channels, we can classify it as a two-way catheter or a three-way catheter. Okay? So this is a three-way catheter. This image shows a three-way catheter. Okay, the, the three-way catheter has three channels, which we will see. It has one funnel that's... Okay, this is the drainage channel. This other channel is for irrigation. And this is for inflating the balloon. Okay, and this is the shaft, and this is the eye and the tip of the catheter. What are the various features of urethral catheter? Okay, for the two way catheter, you have the drainage outlet and valve for inflating the balloon. Injection water is used. Sterile water for injection is used. Then the three-way catheter has in addition the third inlet route for irrigation of bladder using normal saline. Okay. The next we are going to talk about is the indications for urethral catheterization. The indications include for relief of acute urinary retention. When a patient presents with acute urine retention, they will present in pain and suprapubic swelling and inability to pass urine. So it's an indication for catheterization to relieve the urine. Now, in chronic urine retention, the urine is not rapidly re um, relieved because if the urine is rapidly relieved, patient might develop complications like post-obstructive diuresis. So for chronic urine retention, the relief is gradual. There is gradual decompression to prevent post-obstructive diuresis or even hematuria. Now, 
for chronic urine retention with urinary tract infection, hydronephrosis, bladder stones. They are placed on catheter, decompressed gradually and maintained on the catheter. Like for patients with hydronephrosis, they will be maintained on the catheter for a period when the hydroureters and hydronephrosis will regain their sizes. For monitoring of urine outputs, when patient is on fluid therapy, they are placed on urethral catheter and um, urine output is the most reliable method of assessing adequate tissue perfusion. So when you are resuscitating a patient, either in shock or even a patient intra-op, you monitor the urine output. A normal urine output is 0 0.5 to one meals per kg per hour for adults or one to two meals per kg per hour in the pediatric age group. Now, urethral catheter can also be used to stent the urethra following urethroplasty for urinary diversion, okay? For example, in spinal, injured patient using okay clear intermittent catheterization to deliver drugs especially cytotoxic into the bladder to carry out investigations contrast studies such as retrograms you pass catheter to introduce the contrast three-way foley catheter is specially indicated for bladder irrigation after conditions where there is bleeding into the bladder. If the patient have hematuria, okay, bleeding into the bladder, you want to prevent clot formation. You pass three-way catheter and irrigate with normal saline through the irrigation channel or even after patient who had open prostatectomy, you want to irrigate to prevent hematuria and clot retention. Now, what is the procedure for passage of urethral catheter? Passage of urethral catheter is an aseptic procedure, okay? Passage of urethral catheter is an aseptic procedure. It requires an assistant. So when you are faced with a patient who is indicated, okay, who met an indication for catheterization, you should ensure you maintain strict asepsis and you require an assistant because if you do it alone, there is tendency you will contaminate the procedure. So you assemble the materials you need. You get an appropriate size catheter, okay? Xylocaine jelly, sterile water, syringe, penile clam, sterile gloves, cleaning solution, sterile gauze, urine bag, okay? And several other materials you may need. You must ensure you scrub, okay? Glove, position a patient supine and do a routine cleaning of the patient before passage. Now you should instill xylocaine jelly into the urethra. Then you apply the penile clamp for about four minutes, okay? You instill xylocaine into the urethra and clamp for about four minutes. Okay, the, your assistant opens the catheter. You pick up the catheter and the assistant pulls off the plastic tip on the catheter. Then you gently introduce the catheter into the urethra. 
with the phallus maintained perpendicularly. It is then inserted up to the Y junction, okay? When you insert the catheter to the Y junction, you will see urine trickling out of the drainage funnel. Now, sometimes you might get to the Y junction and urine is not trickling out through the, that junction, that funnel. So you just put some suprapubic, you apply some suprapubic pressure to ensure the urine is trickling out, okay? Because sometimes when you pass a catheter, it might coil within the urethra and you are not sure if it is, it is in the bladder, okay? And for such, even if you put pressure in the suprapubic region, they might, you might not see any urine trickling out. And also if the catheter coils within the urethra without reaching the bladder, when you release the catheter, you will see it will bounce back. Okay, so after ensuring the tip of the catheter is in the bladder, then you inject sterile water for injection, okay, to inflate the balloon, okay. Inflating the balloon makes it retain because it's a self-retaining catheter. Now it is then connected to the urine bag for continuous drainage, okay? Now we've talked about coiling of the catheter and failure of drainage after getting to the Y junction. Now, what are the complications of urethral catheterization? There could be injury to the urethra, hemorrhage, false passage, stone formation because it can serve as anidus for infection and subsequently stone formation, urinary tract infection, infection, bladder mucosa metaplasia. They could also be retained catheter. And you should know that usually retained catheter is caused by faulty valve. When you have a faulty valve, Okay, you might be unable to deflate the catheter, the balloon, when it has finished serving its purpose. You want to remove and you find out that you are unable to deflate the balloon. Okay, and this is usually from a faulty valve. Hence, what you do, you just transect the valve and the water in the balloon will drain out. Now it is contraindicated in urethral injury. Presence, when there's a presence of blood at the tip of the meatus, you know there's likely a urethral injury, maybe following trauma, okay? Pelvic trauma, and you notice um, blood at the tip of the meatus. So there's likely a urethral injury, and this will, be contraindicated because if you pass the catheter, there is tendency for further injury to the urethra. Okay. Now it is also contraindicated to suddenly relieve a chronic urine retention. Chronic urine retention should be relieved gradually to prevent post-obstructive diuresis. Next, we'll see the urine bag. The urine bag is for draining urine via urethral catheter. Okay, you can also use it for other purposes, like for creating an abdominal drain. Okay, you can connect it to an NG tube for drainage, okay, during the compression. The next item we'll look at is the NG tube, the nasogastric tube.
Now we'll look at the indications for using a nasogastric tube, okay? The procedure of passing a nasogastric tube, the complications of use of a nasogastric tube. Now, you can see the nasogastric tube, NG tube, okay, commonly called as NG tube. It has the tube, the eye and the tip, okay? And you have the connector here, okay? Now, sometimes this tube might have, depending on the type, it might have a single opening at the tip, or you might have multiple openings by the, along the tube, okay? Close to the tip. The NG tube is about 125 centimeters in length. And at the tip here, you have several, you have several marks, okay? About five marks. Now, these first marks are representations of some certain landmark in the GIT, so that when you are passing your tube, you have an idea where the tip of the NG tube is. Now, from the tip of this tube to the first mark is about 45 centimeters. And this represents, the first mark represents the cardia of the stomach or the esophagogastric junction, okay? Now, the next mark is at 55 centimeters, which represents the position of the body of the stomach, okay? The next is at 65 centimeters. It represents the, the antrum of the stomach, the pylorus, the pylorus of the stomach. Then the fourth is the first part of the duodenum and the fifth is the second part of the duodenum. Okay, you can see each of these parts is 10 centimeters apart. Okay, from the tip to the esophagogastric junction is 45 cm. The next mark represents the body of the stomach. The third mark represents the pylorus of the stomach. The fourth, the first part of the duodenum, and the fifth, the second part of the duodenum. Now, aside this mark, which are landmarks, they also, the tube also have a radioopic line, okay? A radioopic line so that you can use X-ray to actually detect the position of the tube. Now, what are the indications of using an NG tube? The indications are usually classified into diagnostic, prophylactic, and therapeutic indications. For diagnostic uses, for diagnosis of upper GI bleeding, when you pass the NG tube, you see blood drainage of blood. Also for diagnosis of Zollinger Eliasing syndrome by aspirating the gastric content, the amount of gastric aspirate. Also for diagnosis of esophageal atresia, where you have failure of passage of the NG tube due to atresia. Now for prophylaxis, usually is to prevent aspiration of gastric content. So 
you pass an NG tube to empty the stomach and prevent gastric aspiration. Therapeutic uses include gastric decompression, okay, in gastric outlet obstruction or intestinal obstruction. Now for gastric lavage for poisoning, gastric lavage with cool saline to treat upper GI bleeding, feeding of unconscious patients whose GIT is intact. So you should know one of the important therapeutic uses of NG tube is nutrition, okay? And you can also use it for administration of drugs. Now, what is the procedure for insertion of an NG tube? Of course, you create a rapport and explain the indications of the procedure to the patients, okay? You perform hand hygiene and gather your materials that are required for passing the NG tube. You require an appropriate size NG tube, okay? Your syringe, garlic pots, xylocaine spray. You require also um, a, a stethoscope and other materials which you will see. Now, before passing, after you have ensured proper hand washing and you've assembled all your materials, you must visualize, okay, the nostril. Inspect the nostril and the oral cavity of the patient, okay? Assess the best nostril before you begin. Do this by occluding one side and asking the patients to sniff, okay? So that you will know which of the nostrils is more patent. And of course, you know this is only possible for a patient that is conscious. For unconscious patient, they cannot obey your instruction for passage of an NG tube. Okay, ask the patient about previous injury or history of a deviated septum. Now, you position the patient sitting okay, at 45 degrees or even up to 90 degrees, except if it is contraindication, contraindicated with the patient background condition. Now, of course, most of the unconscious patients, you have to pass the, the NG tube in a supine position. Now, the next thing you measure the distance on the, of the tube okay, from the tip of the nose to the ear lobe to the xiphoid process, and then mark the tube at this point. Now, most of the tubes are already marked. You will see when, after measuring the tube from the tip of the nose to the ears, the ear lobe travels of the ear to the zifistanum, they will correspond to the first mark on the NG tube. They will correspond to the first mark on the NG tube. So you lubricate the NG tube, okay? You lubricate accordingly, ensure the tube is well lubricated. You apply your gloves and you spray the xylocaine, okay, spray in the nasal pharynx of the patient to um, reduce the discomfort the patient might experience. Now, have patients flex the head forward and breathe through the mouth. The essence of this is to close the glottis and open the esophagus so that when the, two, the, tube, the tip of the tube gets there, it will enter the esophagus and spare the trachea. Now, and you have to instruct the patient 
um, when they feel sensation at the pharynx, they swallow. Now insert the tube slowly into the patient nostril and advance it steadily, okay? In a downward direction along the bottom of the nasal passage with the curved end pointing downward in the direction of the ear on the same side as the nostril. Ask the patient to swallow when they feel the sensation of the tube in their pharynx. Continue to advance the energy tube until you reach the marked sides, okay? Then, then you have to anchor the tube. Now, after passing the tube and you anchor with a tape on the patient's nostril, then you have to verify the tube is in the stomach. And there are various means you can identify the tube is in the stomach. One, by injecting air into the tube with your st stethoscope placed on the epigastric region, you will hear the sound of influx of air into the stomach. That confirms that the tube is in the stomach. Okay, you can use a litmus paper okay but because when they drain the 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 secretions or the effluent that is drained through the tube from the stomach is acidic and it's turned blue litmus paper to red which signifies that it's an acidic um, content is likely coming from the stomach because if it is coming from the duodenum, if you push the tube far into the duodenum, it means the secretion will be alkali, okay? So, you, if patients is experiencing difficulty, okay, there is tendency and he's coughing and choking, there is tendency of false passage into the airway. And when you place the tube into a galley pot containing water, you will see bubbles of air. Another way of confirming adequate placement of the tube is to use an X-ray. Because we said the tube has a radio opaque lines and you should know when you are inserting an ng tube the caliber matters it depends on the indication when you are passing an ng tube for the purpose of the compression you use a wide caliber ng tube because the rate of drainage will be rapid if it will be faster if the caliber of the tube is wider. And if it's just for feeding purpose, you can use a smaller caliber NG tube. What are the complications of passage of NG tube? Patients might suffer injury to the pharynx, false passage into the trachea, okay, esophageal fibrosis leading to stenosis and stricture, especially those who are on NG tube for a very long time. Esophageal perforation with fistula formation. Injury to esophageal uh, varices. Okay, they, 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 there is also kinking of the tube. Now we are going to talk about ambu bag, ambulatory mechanical breathing unit. Okay, this bag has various parts. The various parts include the face mask, the valve, as well as the bag. Okay, you have the, the face mask, the valve that allows air in one direction, and the bag. And the lower end here, it has an oxygen inlet. Okay, now the air in the bag can be enriched with oxygen via 
a tube connected to the air inlet valve. What are the uses of AMBU bag? It is used for manual resuscitation to give positive pressure ventilation. So when you are doing resuscitation, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, you use an AMBU bag, okay? You use AMBU bag for mechanical ventilation. What are the complications for use? May rupture the alveoli if the pressure applied is too much, especially in infants. So you should know there are appropriate sizes. There are appropriate sizes for infants and for adults. If you are using an adult bag for an infant, you are going to cause barotrauma, injury to the alveoli of the infant's lungs. Endotracheal tube. Endotracheal tube are various types. This is used for intubating a patient and delivering either oxygen or anesthetic agent. There are various types. It could be coughed or uncoughed endotracheal tube. This is the cough balloon that makes it a cough. We'll see the image of the uncoughed type. Now, what are the various parts? You can see it has the connector, the pilot's balloon that is used to inflate the cough okay the cough balloon okay you have the morphe eye and the devil the morphe eye and the devil this is the cough inflation line okay it connects the pilot's balloon to the cough they are made up they are made from plastic say elastic or potets. They are graduated and coated with radio opaque material, the blue line, so that on X-ray you can see the position. The cough tube has a balloon close to the tip and a valve tube for inflating it with air. The cough tube prevents aspiration of secretion into the lungs but can cause pressure necrosis now the essence of this cough is to prevent aspiration because when you pass the tube okay into the airway into the trachea and you inflate the balloon the coughed balloon so whatsoever secretions is coming from above if it's this if this is the trachea and you have the tube within the trachea and you have the balloon inflated okay so it means this cough balloon will prevent any secretion from going down and subsequently this is going to be sucked out so that is the essence of having the cough however this can lead to a pressure necrosis so the uncoughed one is used for patients who have tendency of developing pressure necrosis like the pediatric age group. So use pediatric, um, use the uncoughed endotracheal tube for pediatric patients. However, after passing the uncoughed balloon, this is the uncoughed endotracheal tube. After passing the uncoughed tube, you have to pack, okay? You have to pack with gauze, okay? You have to pack with gauze that is trapped and brought out so that all the secretions don't go beyond the site of your packing. So you should know that the essence of having an uncoughed endotracheal tube is to prevent necrosis. And you can see how the tube is passed on this image it goes into the um, trachea, sparing the esophagus.
So this is face mask. The face mask is used for administration of oxygen, inhalational anesthetic agent, and can also be connected to a to an ambu bag for mechanical ventilation. This is an oropharyngeal airway or oropharyngeal tube. It depresses the tongue to maintain airway used in unconscious patients and during general anesthesia. The commonest cause of airway obstruction in an unconscious patient is the tongue falling back. Okay, is the tongue falling back. So in an unconscious patient, you pass oropharyngeal airway to prevent the tongue falling back. And also during general anesthesia, you have to pass this after placing your endotracheal tube so that the patient doesn't bite on the tube during recovery. So you have to pass an oropharyngeal airway. And you can see it has an opening through which patients take in air and you can also pass a suction tube to remove secretions. Now you should know they are of various sizes which are also color coded. The common ones that are used in the adult, you can see size two to size four. They are the commonly used size. You can see green, yellow, and red. And you can see from three, zero, two, zero, one, zero, and one, they are commonly used in the pediatric age group. Next, we are going to talk about the tracheostomy tube. Tracheostomy tube is a device you use in relieving an airway, an upper airway obstruction. Okay, you want to bypass an upper airway obstruction. And you can see the tube has various parts, okay? And if you look at how the tube have been assembled here, okay? Now you have the sheet and this sheet is connect, it has, a pilot balloon, just like the, just like the endotracheal tube that connects it to the cuff, the cuff balloon, okay? And this mark you see, usually there's an anchor string that is attached to this part. It has an inner cannula, okay? It has an inner cannula. Okay, let's see the various parts we'll talk about, the various areas we'll talk about. Now, there are various types of tracheostomy tube. It could be metallic, okay, it could be portex, which is coughed or non coughed. And it could be a single lumen or a double lumen tube. What are the various parts of a tracheostomy tube? One, it has an introducer, it has the tube itself, okay? You have, okay, the, the inner cannula, you have the cuff, balloon, and the anchor, this an anchor that is a string that is attached, that will be attached to the patient's um, neck. Then you have inflating valve that's part of the pilot's balloon, okay. Now, what are the indications for use of tracheostomy tube? Now, for upper airway obstruction, for upper airway obstruction, e.g. when there is tumors, when there are tumors, infections or foreign body in the airway. So this can be bypassed to secure the airway by passing a tracheostomy tube. In head and neck surgeries, maxillofacial surgeries, 
or injuries. You can pass tracheostomy due to bypass obstruction. It is also indicated for lower airway toileting. For surgical prophylaxis in a patient who had developed tracheostomy, maybe following surgery for a long standing goiter and this collapse of the trachea, you pass a tracheostomy tube. The complications for using tracheostomy tube include pressure necrosis, fibrosis, stenosis of the trachea, fistula formation, wound infection, tube migration, tube occlusion. Now, the items found on the patient bedside Okay, because when you pass a tracheostomy tube for a patient, you cannot vocalize, you cannot speak, except if it's the talking type. You need a bell close to the patient so that he can use it to call attention okay, of the nurses in the ward. And you need to provide a pen and a paper so that patients can communicate by writing. Okay. Then suction machine for uh, to suction aspiration, oxygen, okay, saline, sodium bicarbonate to dissolve cross, tracheal dilator because of narrowing and a spare tracheostomy tube if there is blockage of the one in usage. Now we'll talk about laryngeal mask airway. Now you should know that all these devices used in securing airway are broadly classified as supraglottic or infraglottic. You can see this is lodged above the glottis. Why the endotracheal tube is an infraglottic device. Now this laryngeal mask airway is also used in as in the endotracheal tube. However, this is above the glottis. You use this in patients who you do not anticipate a prolonged operation time. So you use it to deliver anesthetic gases and oxygen. It has various parts. The valve, okay, it has the valve, the pilot's balloon, the inflation line that leads to the, the cough, Okay, the mask aperture, the airway tube, and the proximal connector. Now, it's a supraglottic device, as we mentioned, laryngeal opening for ventilation during general anesthesia or short duration procedure. If you are looking, if you are doing a Long, longer procedure is better you intubate the patient with a cough and the tracheal tube because this is not protecting um, the trachea from aspiration. Now, this is a laryngoscope. A, a laryngoscope is used to visualize the larynx and you also use it for during endotracheal intubation. It has two parts. It has the blade and the handle, okay? The handle is where you insert your batteries. And this is the blade that has a light source. Now, rigid cervical collar. Rigid cervical collar is used for splinting the cervical spine in conditions like fractured cervical vertebra, subluxation of the cervical spine, and in cervical spondylosis. Now you should know that there is a particular type that is preferred in a trauma patient called the Philadelphia cervical collar. This is a rigid cervical collar, but if you notice, it has a halo in front. It has a hollow space which allows better aeration, okay? It has a jaw extension which limits movement, okay? And it is more comfortable. 
and it's even easier to use. You can see usually this as rigid cervical collars, they are detachable. You detach them into two pieces and it is flexible. So this lower piece can be slided under the patient's neck while the upper piece is placed in front and it is now coupled together to maintain uh, the protection of the cervical spine. Now this soft cervical collar, the non-rigid type is not effective for splinting cervical spine. So this soft cervical collar is not really useful in splitting cervical spine. Now we'll talk about the chest tube. This is a chest tube, okay? There are various types of chest tube. You can have a chest tube with a trocar like this on this image or a chest tube without a trocar. Usually this chest tube with a trocar has a sharp tip. The trocar has a sharp tip, which actually points out through the eye of the chest tube. Okay? You can see the trocar in, in, inside this, it has a sharp tip, which can usually um, can be used to pass the chest tube, okay? Now, when you pass a chest tube, of course, it is connected to an underwater seal container for the drainage. Now, what are the indications for passing a chest tube? Now, let's see the features of the chest tube. It's made up of plastic or elastic material, and it is graduated. Okay, you see various calibration. It has fenestration at the tip that enable drainage, okay? Now, it is coated with radio-opaque material, the blue line, in such a way that X-ray will show its position. Usually drain into an underwater seal container, okay? underwater seal to prevent pneumothorax. The underwater seal tank aids active drainage by exerting negative pressure on the pleural space. What are the indications for passing a chest tube for massive pleural effusion, like massive hemothorax, massive hydrothorax, or pneumothorax, or empyema thoracis, post thoracotomy, a chest tube must be inserted any time the chest is open to prevent iatrogenic pneumothorax. A chest x-ray must be done before the passage, immediately after the passage and before removal of the chest tube. How do you care for the chest tube? Now, when you pass a chest tube, you have to care for it. If not, you might, the patient might develop some certain complication. And to remember your care, you can use the stop mnemonic. The stop mnemonic. Now the S will represent storage. Note the daily volume that is being drained. Okay? You note the daily volume that is being drain. Now, you should also look at the, not only the volume, the nature of what is being drained. Okay, whether there is change in the effluence that is being drained. T represent the tube. You check the nature, okay, of the current effluent from the tube. Check the tube is still patent, okay? Look for kinking and you should ensure oscillation, okay? An oscillating column within the tube which ensure that the tube is in the right space, okay? Now, oh, the opening. This is the area 
of the skin where the tube enters the body. It has to be cared for. It has to be regularly dressed. If not, you might have infection and skin excoriation around the opening where the tube enters the body. P, the patient, examine the patient as a whole, okay, and check the purpose for which the tube was inserted is being served, okay? Look out for sign of improvement. Any complication in the patient, look out for. Now, what are the complications of passing a chest tube? The complications include injury to the neurovascular bundle of the intercostal space, injury to the lungs, injury to the heart in rare case, wrong placement into the stomach, infection in the pleural space, is, okay? Then fistula formation, hydrogenic pneumothorax. You should know when passing a chest tube, it is passed into the triangle of safety. Now, where do you pass a chest tube? Into the triangle of safety. The triangle of safety is bounded anteriorly by the anterior axillary line or the lateral fold of the pectoralis major muscle. Posteriorly, it's bounded by the mid axillary line. Posteriorly, it is bounded by the mid axillary line. or the anterior border of the latissimus dorsi, and inferiorly is bounded by the fifth intercostal space or the upper border of the sixth rib. So this is the triangle of safety. So you pass the chest tube in the intercostal species, usually the fourth intercostal space, you pass it above the rib in the intercostal space you are passing it because if you go below that rib you there is tendency of injury to the neurovascular bundle now sutures sutures are defined as strand of materials that are used for approximation of wound edges or ligation of blood vessels. They are classified into either natural or synthetic, absorbable or non-absorbable sutures. So the main aim of suture is to approximate wound edges or ligation of blood vessels. Now they can be classified as natural or synthetic. They can also be classified as absorbable, non-absorbable. So you see the various types of sutures. Okay, this natural sutures include the stainless steel sutures, the synthetic one. Here you have stainless steel. Okay. Then synthetic ones, you have like the Vicream. Okay. The nylon and so on. The absorbable, the non absorbable sutures. Okay. Include the silk, the 
The non-absorbable sutures include the silk, the stainless steel, the nylon, and so on. The absorbable sutures include the chromic, vicryl sutures, okay, monocryl, and so on. Now, you should know that the classification of sutures are even the um, synthetic are also classified as absorbable and non-absorbable. So you should read around the classification of sutures, properties of an ideal suture. Sutures should have low memory. It should have high tensile strength. It should be sterile, okay? And several properties of an ideal suture. So you should read around suture. It's and also you should be able to identify the type of suture that is asked and surgeries that can be used for a part, with a particular suture that is asked. This a urethral sound or a urethral bougie or a urethral dilate, uh, dilator. It is used for dilatation of partial urethral structure. And this is usually serial dilatation, okay? You can use it also to locate the site of a urethral structure. Complications of use could include trauma, urethral trauma, you could have infection, you could have false passage. Now drain, drain is defined as a material for diverting fluids or gases from cavity. Okay, you use drain to divert fluid materials, um, you di di um, divert fluids or air from cavities or wounds. You should know the properties of an ideal drain and how to classify drain, okay? Now, you classify drain usually into either active or passive, which we will see shortly. Now, open or closed drain, okay? Irritants, non-irritants drain, internal, external drain, when you remove a drain, when it has served its purpose. And you should also know about mobilization of a drain, then complication of its use, okay? These are the various classification. We said drain is, a material or device that is used to divert fluid or gas from a body cavity or wound. It is classified as open or closed, active or passive, internal or external, irritants or non-irritant. Properties of an ideal drain must be sterile, must be inert, unless if used as an irritant drain. It should not be hard prevent injury, okay? Tube should be wide. It should not be too soft. Removal, a drain should be removed when it has served its function, okay? Now, the nature of the effluent change Maybe initially you are draining a purulent effluent, it becomes serous, okay? And for purulent effluent, you know it should completely stop. You don't want any pus within a cavity. If you are draining a bloody effluent, it becomes serous, okay? This is an image of a ready bag drain. Okay, this is also a ready valve drain, different type. This is a corrugated cover drain. This is an active drain. It's a closed drain. Okay, this is an open drain and a passive drain. Oropharyngeal airway. Oropharyngeal airway, you can see, we've talked about this earlier on, so I'm going to skip this intravenous cannula, okay, intravenous cannula. Now, this intravenous cannula is indicated for 
there are various indications. It has diagnostic indications and therapeutic indications, which we will see shortly. And they are of different sizes. And these sizes are color coded. Now you can see these two are called white ball cannula, size 14 and size 16. Size 14 is orange, size 16 is gray, okay? Size 18 is green, size 20 pink, 22 blue, and 24 yellow. Sometimes you can see a white size 14. Okay, now this image shows the various parts of a cannula. Now, you should know how to pass a cannula. Okay, but before that, what are the indications? One, diagnostic. The diagnostic, you insert to take samples, okay? Samples for blood investigations you can pass an intravenous cannula. You can also pass cannula to inject contrast for diagnostic purpose like CT scan. Okay. Therapeutic purpose. Administer drugs. Okay, give IV fluids. All these are therapeutic purposes. Now, cannula can also be used, a white ball cannula, you can pass it for in a patient presenting with tension pneumothorax, you can pass a white ball cannula into the second intercostal space mid clavicular line and there will be sudden gush of air, okay? It's also for therapeutic purpose. Now, when you are passing a cannula, you need all these materials, okay? Sterile injection pack containing platinum wool spirited, swap plaster, tourniquet, appropriate size cannula, five mil syringe injection water. Okay, these are the various steps in passing an IV cannula, apply a tourniquet and wait to see dilated veins in the part you choose to use. Okay, either cubital fossa forearm or dosum of the arm. And of course, it's preferable if the arm is placed at a lower position so that these veins will be engorged. Then clean this part with methylated spirit and pass the cannula through the skin into the vein. Okay, initially you are holding it, inclining at 45 degrees, you gently pass into the vein. And when you see a flow of um, blood in the flush back chamber, then you now gently pull the the needle and gradually advance the cannula into the vein. Then when it's in the vein, you flush with water and you secure with plaster. You can see this is a bladder syringe. How you identify the bladder syringe, you can see the tip is cone-like, okay, it's cone-like and it is a 60 mils, not a 50 mil syringe. Bladder syringe, you can see it's 60 mils, and it has a cone-like tip. And these you use in, for bladder irrigation. Bladder syringe is used for bladder washout or lavage, okay? Small volumes of saline are used, less than 10 mils. Do not exert too much pressure to avoid, to avoid bladder rupture. Okay, IV giving set for administration of fluid, and you should know how to calculate the number of drops per minute, and you should know this differ from 
the blood giving set by having no filter in the chamber. And how to calculate the number of drops per minute? You have to calculate the total, the drops per minute. The total volume of fluid you are giving divide by the duration. You want to give that multiply by a constant, which for IV given sets, the constant is 20. For blood given sets, the constant is 15. And for solo sets, the constant is 60. So the total volume divide by the duration, okay? And if you say you want to calculate per second, you know, you have, to multiply by, if you say per minute, you multiply, if you are giving drops per minute, if you want to give in four hours, you multiply by 60. If you want to convert per second, you multiply by 60. Okay. So these are the various parts. It has a connector, it has a chamber, the infusion tube, the regulator, and the connector to the cannula. These are the various parts, okay? This is the chamber, the tube, the regulator, okay? The connector to the cannula. Now you can see the blood giving set has a filter and this chamber is longer than that of the giving uh, IV giving set. The blood giving set has a filter in the chamber. Okay. So these are also similar. Now this is plastibel. It is used for circumcision. It is used for circumcision. Plastibel. This is the plastic bell and it has a string. Okay. The follows the prepuce is lodged. Okay. Over this. And the tip of the glands is within this. And it is now tied with the string and excised. Okay. A device shaped like a bell used for circumcision. It has a ring with groove on the outside, which fits around the glands and a ligature, which is used to tie the prepuce over the groove, okay? The handle is broken off after this. The precaution appropriate size for the glands, okay? So that you don't cause um, retention after use. Now this is the solo set. We already mentioned that if this is used for neonates to prevent fluid overload. So it has a cylindrical bullet here that is calibrated so that you can titrate the amount of fluid you want to administer. At the same time, you regulate using the regulator. And don't forget the constant you use here, the K is 60, okay? Part of the solid set include connector to drip infusion tube to let the infusion into the calibrated chamber. Inlet for air to allow atmospheric air pressure drive the infusion. Calibrated fluid chamber deliver fixed volume so that you don't overload. You cannot bring a liter of normal saline and hang it on a unit. Okay, you have to calibrate the amount you want to give the unit and you now calculate the drops per second. It has a valve, a stopper, okay, within the chamber that prevents air embolism. Okay. So we are going to um, 
stop here, then we'll proceed to the interactive session. If you have any questions, you are free to ask your question. So um, I'm going to unmute all of you. If you have any questions, then you can ask, please. You unmute yourself, then you ask the question. Any question? Do you have any question? Okay, I believe. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, yes, sir. I thank you for the presentation. My question is on the plastic ball, the last one. Okay. So, um, sir, so after placing the plastic ball, um, when the handle is broken off. What about the remaining part of the plastic bag? When is it removed? Okay, that is a good question. Our question is about the plastic bag. If you look at the plastic bag, it has a bell. And a handle. Now, this bell has groove. What you do, if you know, the, the glands has a scriptural skin like this. So what happened is this glands lodge here and the scriptural skin is above, okay? Then you now tie that string. Now, when you tie that string, you use your scissors to cut off the excess of this. Now, what happens is this is broken off, is broken off, and this string exerts pressure necrosis on the prepuce, is tied. So it undergoes ischemia and it sloughs off. So when it sloughs off, it will fall off with the other part, the bell. It falls off with the bell. So that's why you shouldn't use, there are various sizes. If you use a plastic bell that is tightly fit to the glands, you might have retained plastic bell that the patients have to come back for removal. Okay, and that might even be causing edema of the palus, of the glands. So what happens to the bell, it falls off, okay? It falls off on its own. Is it clear? Yes, sir. Yeah. Any other question? Okay, I believe there is no any other question. But if you have a question, you should ask. Otherwise, we have come to the end of this session. Okay, thank you all for participating. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, sir. You're welcome.